I, I think the best time to network is when you don't need anything. Welcome to the Final Round Podcast, where our mission is to help you knock out the competition and land your dream job. With the first episode of the Final Round Podcast, I sit down with Bruce Smolin, a talent acquisition senior specialist at the Boston Consulting Group, or BCG for short. He has recruited for the BCG LA office for over 15 years, and during that time, he has reviewed thousands of applications and helped recruit hundreds of consultants into BCG offices all over North America. Here are some questions we will be answering. How to break into consulting, especially with a non-linear career path? How to get referrals? Are cover letters important? What should you ask a recruiter at a company event? How to best navigate virtual recruiting events? how to properly network, especially for introverts, how often and when you should follow up when networking, and should you ask for feedback if you get rejected. Let's dive into the show. Welcome, Bruce, to the Final Round podcast. We are thrilled to have you as our first guest on the show. Wow. Yay. (laughs) To give the audience some background, I have known you for a few years now. I actually cold emailed you a few years ago when I was studying at USC to ask if Boston Consulting Group would be interested in sponsoring the student organization that I launched called the Latino Business Student Association. Thanks to you and BCG, we were able to grow the LBSA to one of the largest student organizations on campus and have helped countless students and countless students land internships and jobs. And it is remarkable that BCG was our organization's first company sponsor and two years later, you are here today as our first guest on the show. So it is great to have you here today again, Bruce. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm happy to be here. So I really think a great place to start would be to talk about your specific career path. I think a lot of students and professionals think to break into these very competitive industries like consulting and investment banking, you have to have a very linear career path, as in three summer consulting internships before breaking into that consulting full-time job. But I know for you, you don't come from a very linear career path. Do you mind kind of sharing how you have gotten to become the recruiter at BCG? Sure. So keeping in mind, yes, I am a recruiter at BCG. So I'm not a, I'm not a member of the consulting staff. And I had a very unusual um, entry into BCG. I started as a, um, I, I was hired to move boxes. And <laughs> boxes. BCG was, boxes. Uh-huh. Um, you know, as you know, I'm very strong. <laughs> and um, I was moving from the 33rd, uh, BCG was moving from the 33rd floor to the 32nd floor of their old building. And they just needed someone to move boxes. And so it was, it was very simply, um, a, it was a temp job. And um, I went into this temp job and all of a sudden I was, um, uh, after the three days, and I'm sorry to say, but there were three days that I was hired to work. Mm-hmm. There were three, uh, two other USC guys with me. Okay. Um, they dropped those two guys after the third day and they kept me. Those guys are probably making millions of dollars anyway, right now. So it's perfectly fine. <laughs> the survival of the fittest. They wanted the strongest. The exactly. Strongest. Okay. And, and uh, I mean, at that point I had just been, I had worked at so many places. I was probably was just a, a better worker at that point. They were college students and I was, I was a more experienced person. Um, I left at, at that time. Um, they kept on asking me to come back because they saw HR in my resume I, I was um, doing, I just started doing some HR work. Mm-hmm. Um, I even watched, I did everything. I even watched the phones. Um, and then um, at a certain point, recruiting season hit and the woman that was in charge of recruiting said, I want him to work with me. And um, so I was, that's when I started doing recruiting for BCG. Um, and I think my advantage to anyone coming into BCG and knowing that it's a special place is that I worked at a lot of places before I got there. Mm -hmm. And, um, I never, I never thought that, um, I never met, I never talked to partners in other, any other place I worked at. Um, I always listened to rules that came down from above and I did things, um, and just complain. I think that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. And, um, and I knew from watching television that whenever you run into someone who's super educated, they're usually pompous and they're just mean, right? Mm -hmm. And all these things, right, when I started at BCG, they just, it just took them and it flipped it, it flipped it on its head because everyone that I was meeting with, you know, Stanford and MIT and HBS and Wharton, they were all there. And I had never interacted with people like that before. And they were just the nicest people I'd ever met. And these aren't people that are working, that are in a 
at the very top, these are entry level people. And um, and there was a certain point when um, the recruiting coordinator came up to me and she said, Bruce, we're going to have a meeting with the recruiting partner. Um, I think you know Danny Friedman. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, I said, okay, well, tell me what you talked about. And she said, um, no, Bruce, we want you in the meeting. So I'm like, okay, well, you must want me to take notes. And she said, no, Bruce, just come to the meeting. Right. And so I'm in the meeting and then here's Danny, who's a very approachable guy, very likable guy, a partner at the firm. And here I am, a temp. And we're, he's asking me, Bruce, what do you think? And I give him ideas. And he said, that's a great idea. We should do this. And all of a sudden, you have the highest person, one of the highest people in the firm, and one of the lowest people and working together get the, get the, to get the job done. So now, all of a sudden, I was working with people who were just like so, so high up there. And we were being very collaborative. And it was just like, it, it, it just really, everything I expected um, from my experience was just like totally totally opposite at BCG, which is why I've been there for 15 years. Well, that's fast that's forward to 15 years later. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely an amazing story. And I would say that, you know, every company, it seems like prides themselves on their people and their culture, but it seems like uh, you were really given a voice, even just starting off and people, you know, the highest up in the firm and people maybe just starting off were able to collaborate. And I've definitely felt like that working with both you, with Danny and some other BCGers that when I cold emailed you and I had this idea to help more students, it wasn't more so that you needed to be this huge, you know, podcaster, this huge organization already at a top school, but you gave us a voice. So I think that's such an important part about BCG's culture. And then when you were going in to, you know, move boxes, did you ever think that you can use it to network and become a recruiter or is it more so a random happenstance? Well, see, and that's the thing about temping. I mean, I, I tempt a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of every temp jobs, the, the advantages of temping are, you, you know it's temporary, right? So it's gonna be two weeks. And so you can do anything for two weeks. It's just like, you can do the most miserable job for two weeks. And, and so you're gonna bring a lot of energy to it. Can you only imagine if you, they give you something miserable to do and they, they're like, and then it's tell you, this is for the rest of your life. <laughs> and you're like, oh man. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the nice thing. I was a very, very good worker um, because it was just a, for a short period of time. And also you don't get involved with any of the politics of the office. You know, you're not, you're not hanging around, you're not talking to people, you're just working. And so at the end of a lot of temping agency or temp assignments, people would come up to me afterwards and say, and they'd start asking questions and they'd say, well, what do you, what do you want to do with your life? Where do you want to go? And I would say probably like 75% of those positions ended up with someone saying, do you want to work here full time? Wow. And so temping is a very good way of getting into a company. I would say with BCG, not likely. I haven't seen I haven't seen anyone do that. But um, as far as on the consultant side, mm -hmm. but you'll find that um, BCGers are very mentorish. They want to they um, they want to help you. They want to give you guidance and, and things like that. So um, there is something to reaching out and getting to know them. But as far as um, it was not my intention at all. My intention was to help a friend and my friend owned the temp agency. And my, my idea was just to go in there and get done with those three days. And that would be it. Got it. So it seems like you went in with a pretty open mind, but you wanted to make sure that if the, you know, temporary engagement ended after, let's say two weeks, that you'd made sure that you really showed yourself in a good light and they almost wanted you back. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's a great point for internships. And that I know whenever I went into an internship, my goal was not just to, you know, get some experience, but really to get a return offer and provide so much value to where, you know, you're an asset to the company. So obviously you've seen probably thousands of interns come through BCG and, you know, not everyone makes it to that final, um, that final stage of getting the return offer. What would you say in terms of, you know, the interns at BCG that you've seen, what is that one quality or the one thing that they do to get the return offer to come back? Um, I, I think, I think it is that I think some people get the internship at BCG and they're like, I did it. Mm -hmm. I, I did it. Right. Yeah. And, but the ones who get the internship at BCG and realize that that's just the first step and the next step is full time. Mm -hmm. And that, that is the, they're the ones that are going to be, um, that are going to be coming back. They're going to get an offer to come back. There's a, you know, a majority of the people that we um, that we have as summer interns do get an offer to come back. But um, I've had people who've come in and they just didn't. Um, 
it's almost like they were celebrating this internship that they had that the, you know they had done it they made it they were they had a summer internship at bcg and it's like no now the goal is full-time you have to work really hard to get to that full-time goal and then the goal after that and this is the way bcg is the goal after full-time is now you're an associate next goal consultant next goal project leader you know it's like common constantly what's next what's the next challenge and so it, it might be a good um, it might be a good filter for us when we do see people and they just um, they don't have that like what's next uh, what am I gonna where am I gonna get next or what is, what can I learn how can I get to the next level and just feel very satisfied with where they are that's not a BCG got it so it seems like the word complacent you know you cannot be complacent going into a company yeah. like BCG and it's not even that you're never satisfied but I think a BCG's main quality is you want it to continue want to continue to grow and provide value. Um, and I think a great analogy would be that, you know, someone makes it to the NBA or the NFL and they think their work's done, but the work's just getting started. And now it's actually seeing if you can compete against this top talent. But I guess if we were to take a couple steps back before, you know, because obviously there's not that many people that get the opportunity to intern at BCG. Let's talk about actually just the process of applying to BCG. So what are some things that you've noticed? Um, I'm sure you get a ton, tens of thousands of people reach out to you. Um, you know, over the span of your uh, kind of recruiting career, what are some things you've noticed that have really stood out? Because, you know, you have to choose what you want to respond to in terms of an email or outreach message and others that you choose not to respond to. Yeah. I sometimes, I, I feel so bad because people email me. Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't let me get away with this because you're pretty good at like almost the next day saying, hey, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I followed up multiple times and um, um, yeah. Uh, and I'm, sometimes I get, I, I search through my emails. Maybe I'm searching f- for a, a certain message mm-hmm. and I find a message from six months ago and it's a student who's reached out to me mm-hmm. and I read it and, but I, I marked it as unread because I wanted to get back to him because I wanted to have a decent response to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I never did. And part of me feels just really bad that I never responded back to these people, but then um, the other part of me is thinking, like, seriously, this is this is it. You re- you sent me one email and I didn't respond, and that's it. And so you have to be, um, and I'm not going to say aggressive, but you have to. If someone doesn't respond to you, then you follow up. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say necessarily the next day. <laughs> I would say, you know, give them a couple of days, mm-hmm. and then follow up with them, and then that shows that you're interested. Um, and, um, I think that that's a big part of BCG. It's just, um, there's a lot of really, really smart people who are applying. There's a lot of, um, and there's a lot of resumes you're looking at and it's just like one, one doesn't distinguish itself from the other. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you know what, it's, it's probably good for us to look at your name and say, Hey, you know what? That's not the first time I've heard this name. Mm-hmm. positive or negative I've heard this name before and then let me go do some research and it's like oh this person has made the um, effort to get in touch with me as a matter of fact this person's had a conversation with me um, nothing negative pops out it's actually a really good conversation so um, so the networking is a big part of BCG that doesn't mean hey you know speak with Bruce and you got an interview that just means um showing your interest showing your interest and because you're more likely if you have an interest in bcg to do well in the interviews because you probably did your research you probably know what the interviews are all about um and um and you're gonna the week before you we contact you and say hey we have an interview with bcg you're not going to say um what's the case interview absolutely no no (laughs) this is all super helpful i think the main takeaways from kind of what you said is be proactive right? Mm -hmm. If the recruiter doesn't follow up, don't maybe do what I did in the past and follow up the next day, but you should follow up maybe after a few days or after a week to see, you know, the recruiter's busy. They got a lot, a lot of outreach messages, but be proactive because other people are not going to follow up. And I think the second thing you were alluding to is the importance of networking. And again, I think everyone knows, you know, you hear networking as this huge buzzword with recruiting, but kind of getting into the thick of what really is networking and how to do it effectively I guess the first thing is a lot of students and professionals are super busy and I, can, I cannot offer anything in return. How would you kind of answer that person in terms of encouraging them to reach out to not just you, but any recruiter to start that networking process? Yeah, I think that they just have to um, think about what is the worst thing that could happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
and the worst thing that could happen is not going to happen, which is the worst thing that could happen is I could say, how dare you? How dare you contact me? <laughs> I am Bruce, right? <laughs> Um, but that's not going to happen. If anything, it's like your, your email is going to get ignored, but then you just follow up again. Um, you'll find, as I mentioned before, you'll find that BCGers are very mentorish. Mm -hmm. They like to talk about themselves. They like to talk about the things that they've done. They like to hear about unusual experiences. They like to, they like to have a connection with people. Um, when you're networking, don't just mention things like, um, uh, the, the worst thing, not the worst thing you can do, but if, if you send an email out and it just says, I'm really interested in BCG and I wanna know more about your career path mm -hmm. and send it to every partner in the LA office or any partner that you can reach, they will see that as very generic. Um, they do talk to each other and then pretty soon what's gonna happen is you will end up talking to Bruce because they will say, you know, I don't necessarily wanna talk to this person because there's not any connection. If you say, hey, you know what? I worked at uh, Mercedes-Benz and I noticed that you're the automotive person here. And I'd like to discuss how you um, started as a, as a strong female in, the, in a consulting business. Can you tell me as a female, how, how, how can, can, what are the difficulties that you're experiencing? Something that they can identify with. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, there's a person in our office and she is from a, a school that we would normally not recruit from. And she said that she had absolutely no one to network with. And so she just started calling people at USA who are in the office or, or LinkedIn messaging them and said, Hey, I'm from a PAC 12 school and you're from a PAC 12 school. Would you like to talk about um, your consulting experience? And if not, would you like to talk about um, sports? Mm -hmm. And they took, they took the, they took the hook <laughs> and now she's working at BCG. Wow. Um, and um, so, so there's, there's just, just thinking about what is the commonality that we have? What are the common interests that we have? Mm -hmm. A reason for them wanting to talk to me. Um, do not spam people. If anything, you know, send an email out. If you don't hear anything, try again. Um, if you don't hear anything after that, try someone else. But don't try everyone at the same time. Um, don't put all your effort into that, because even if you network, even if you're the best networker, and that leads to an interview, you still have to deal with the interviews when they come up. So you still have to spend a good amount of time studying for the interviews. Don't use all, all on networking. Got it. No, absolutely. I think similar to what you were saying with an internship, the work's just getting started. I think getting an interview is a huge accomplishment for you know a company like BCG. But that's only the first step and then it's the next round and then it's the final round yeah. um, but i love how you were saying that you know there's not one perfect email template to reach out to for kind of networking because if you're using a template it's probably not tailored enough and i love how you were saying the example of a partner you know working in automotive and you worked at maybe you know tesla last summer i love tailoring it and i guess you know now that we kind of know how to reach out and uh, network when is the best time to do it let's say that you know, there's a junior summer internship and a full-time job that comes with say senior year. So is the best time to start early as in freshman, sophomore year, or start closer to when the candidate's actually eligible to apply for the position? I think it's, it's like, um, you know, how you get those emails from people and you haven't heard from your friends who you haven't heard from for five years <laughs> yeah. and all of a sudden they're emailing you and they're like, Oh, and by the way, I heard you just got this great job and I'd like to apply there. You don't want to be that guy. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you want to, I, I think the best time to network is when you don't need anything. And, um, and what's great about, um, Whenever we have any events, we always, you know, people say, do you want to invite just sophomores and juniors because they're eligible? And it's like, no, freshmen are fine too. Mm -hmm. And I like to meet with freshmen because I like to be able to tell them, you know, grades are important. You know, I can still affect you as opposed to a senior. It's like, grades are important. They're like, well, there's nothing <laughs> I can do about it. Uh -huh. um, but so um, start as, as early as you can. I mean, there's nothing about it. I mean, there's not some, there's, there's some stuff that we just won't be able to do anything with you, but you can attend the presentations and you can attend, you can get us to know you. And I have to say, it is a really great feeling when people get offers and they are people who you met as freshmen mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they're getting an offer at BCG, or you see that they listened to your advice and they networked, um, and they came, um, it's nice to see that they're they're 
the resumes are as impressive as you would have hoped, you know, as when you, when you thought that this is a great person, I hope they succeed. But um, don't, don't wait until the last minute. Don't wait until, um, don't try two weeks before. Um, at the same time, if you were to network with somebody and do it really early as a freshman, there is no, you should also reach out to them occasionally and say, hey, I'd like to provide you with an update. This is what I'm doing now. And by the way, I'm now a sophomore and I'm eligible to apply for a junior internship. You so know, that's, not, so, that's not annoying to a recruiter that you, you know, maybe outreach freshman or sophomore year and yeah. every, you know, four to six months, you're saying, hey, Bruce, wanted to update you. I took your advice on being more involved on campus. I'm now, you know, um, a director in X organization on campus and I'll continue, you know, hope everything's all uh, well with you. Yeah. No, that's great. I, I think that's, that's great when we can do that. Got it. And then I think everyone thinks that with networking, you have to get something in return as in the referral. And I know some companies have referrals, other companies don't, but what advice would you give to students who, you know, maybe are networking, not to just to get a referral, but to obviously meet employees at the company, but know that a referral is something that if you can get a referral, it's, you know, very helpful to push you through the process. Um, well, that's, I, I mean, again, that's more likely if you have a, a better relationship with these people, if you, mm -hmm. you spend more time, um, the referrals also, it's hard to ask for a referral. You know, you can only imagine going up to someone and saying like, Hey, by the way, I'm applying now. Would you refer me? Unless you're very close at that point. You so know, should you ask, or should it be something that someone on the other side says, I really like you and I want to refer you? I, I think the thing about, um, about BCG that I've noticed, or, or just about any company, mm -hmm. is that you don't get things unless you ask for them. Mm -hmm. And there isn't someone who's going to come up to you and say, hey, do you want a job? <laughs> So you, you have to, you have to be that person who asks for stuff mm -hmm. because that's the only way you're going to get it because no one's going to read your mind at the same time. I think that um, there's a way of asking for it without really asking for it. I'm about to apply for, um, Hey, so-and-so I've been, I've been talking to you for two years. I'm about to apply for the, the full-time position with BCG. I just wanted to keep you posted. Got it. And then you can leave it up to them. It's like, wait a second, you're fantastic. I want to refer you for this. The referral is a strong thing, but at the same time, your referral is going to go through. And when when we're you're, when you're talking to a person, um, um, when you're talking to your friends, and and you think that this person's fantastic, the things that you never usually usually talk about is you don't talk about your test scores, <laughs> you don't talk about your GPA necessarily. Yeah. You talk about maybe some of your other activities. And so you're, you may think that this person's wonderful and they may think, you know, a referrer may think that the, the candidate's wonderful, but the bottom line is we ask for a lot of things that you never have in a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so you still have to have all of those very, you know, solid parts of your resume um, that, that a referral does help. And the referral is, telling us that there is going to be someone who's probably going to support you. And as far as like help you study and answer a lot of questions about BCG, and maybe it will be easier for to convince you to come over to BCG once we do make you an offer. But um, there still are a lot of things that we're looking at. And so um, it's um, a referral is nice, but it's not magic. It's, it's not, not magic. a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. Yes. Yes. Got it. And then with, you know, with networking and, and trying to meet as many people as you can at the company, would you rather a candidate reach out to you first, kind of share their story and then reach out to other BCGers or kind of the other way where they meet other people and then get diverted back to you? Mm, you know what? I don't, um, I, I do appreciate people who are a little scrappy mm -hmm. and can find the people um, from UCLA and USC and Pomona College and all those places that are currently working at BCG um, and, and putting some effort into that as opposed to contacting me and saying at the end of it, it's like, by the way, is there anyone else I can talk to? Um, so I, I think that I am probably the best at giving advice for, hey, there's, a, there's a, some problems with my resume Mm -hmm. or um, 
what is the best way to um, approach this uh, or approach, um, you know, getting getting a job at BCG now that we're we're past the um, past the traditional cycles, that type of thing. Got it. And I'm probably best at that. Um, they're best, of course, answering questions about, you know, this is these are the projects I've worked on. But um, either or, but um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say um, use me to network with other people. But um, you know, I, I can be I can be helpful in in certain ways, and then they can be. But um, there's there's no preference as far as the the timing. I love how you said that you value people who are scrappy and creative and do their research and finally get in contact with you. And once they have that you know that info call or that video call scheduled on the calendar. And it's five minutes before you're about to hop on and, and have a call with, you know, Bruce, the BCG recruiter. What do you want to hear, right? I'm sure you've, you've had thousands of calls with candidates over the years. What are some things that you think people should focus on asking or sharing? And what are some kind of red flags as in, you should not be telling me this. I don't want to hear this. You're kind of, you know, wasting time because this is not something that you should be sharing. Um, I think that I... I... I mean, you want to have a conversation, right? Um, and, and this isn't necessarily a sharing issue, but I, I want to know, um, it, it, this is very much like when you're doing a case interview. Yep. I cannot help you unless you're transparent with me. And so if you, if you have a problem with your, um, your SAT scores, I don't have any. I went to a junior college. Okay, well, let me know. Um, I don't, um, my GPA is low, but then I had issues. I was having family issues. Let me know. You know, I, I can't help you unless I know these things. And, and I, I am probably one of the few people that can ask these questions. I mean, tell me your, what your GPA is, tell me your test scores, tell me what your internships are and all this stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't say I, I would, I wouldn't be concerned about anything that you're saying unless you just said like, I'm really lazy, but you know, <laughs> if you're joking around, then it doesn't matter that much. Uh -huh. um, so I don't, I don't know if there's anything, I, I, I would caution people against having a list of questions. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a list of questions, but it just comes out so bad sometimes in that um, once you have a, once you answer a question, they're like, oh, okay. And so my next question is blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, okay, you obviously have a list as opposed to just having a conversation, kind of like building off what I just said. Mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's just have a, you know, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. And, you know, if you, if you do have a list of questions, we'll just work them in a little bit smoother than, than just this really boring conversation because that's, 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 that's also memorable as like well. Like my third question, Bruce, that I wanted to ask you out of five yes. is X. Yes. Yes, and you want to build off each other, and you want to have like you know you you go back and forth. Um, I mean, keep in mind that what BCG is looking for, and this is even in the case interviews, mm -hmm. they're looking for people who. Um, how are you going to be dealing with the client? Are you going to be really stiff? Are you are you going to be someone who is who brings energy? Um, are you a person who's curious? Um, you know, so we're we're. And I'm not saying I have a checklist and I'm checking these things off, but you're kind of like getting the feel for this person. And if this person is just like not exciting at all and just like a very flat and do you really want to spend 12 hours in a room with this person? Um, you know, when you're working, it's like, I don't think so. You know, you want to, you want someone who just kind of like you recharges you, you know, and makes you want to just like, I want to keep talking. There was this one guy I was talking to. Sorry, I'm going to derail a little bit. No, no, no. I, I, let's hear the story. I have, a, I have a tendency to talk to people probably longer than I should. And I was talking to one candidate and um, he was saying like, um, hey, Bruce, and he asked, asked questions. It was going, the conversation was going nicely. And I said, um, he says, oh, Bruce, but I'm really, I, I'm afraid that I'm going to be, I'm wasting your time. Um, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to end the call here. And I said, no, that's okay. I have plenty of time if you want to keep chatting. And I started talking about something else. He said, um, well, you know, actually I have another call. <laughs> I got to get off the phone. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. If the BCG recruiter wants to spend more time talking with you, you should cancel your other yeah. call. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> you just, but you I know just I loved, I mean, you had so many points in there that I think that when you're speaking with the recruiter, yes, it's not a formal interview, but it's testing your client readiness, right? 
if you're going for a consulting position, right? Yes, they want to check off all these boxes and see how well you can case and your analytics and, yeah. and kind of your background, but it's more so, do I like you? Do I want to work with you? And, you know, do I want to go over time to continue speaking with you, right? Because obviously yeah. with consulting, there's travel, you know, there are, you know, long hours and there, it's hard work. So I think when you're going through it, A, not having just canned questions that kind of just listening off one, two, three, four, now I'm done. Uh, yeah. having more of a conversation. And it seems like also you want to hear the candidate story. You want to hear, you know, what's some good parts of their application. What are some things that you need to improve on? Would you agree? Yeah. yeah and I would say um, what BCG really doesn't like is when things are canned. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to, you're going to have to think about your story. This is my, this is my story. And this is why I wanted, why I want to be consultant or this is what I've done. But it, when you just, um, when you just start a conversation with, hi, I'm so-and-so and, -so and I'm, I've done this. And then for the next five minutes, the guy just talks about himself. Um, like I said, BCGers like to talk about them, themselves. And so they're just like, well, it's my turn. Huh. <laughs> um, and so I would be concerned about that and, and just being a, a better conversationalist. And that just means a lot more back and forth. Got it. And you can even I, I've heard people who've come in and they've asked, they've started with the conversation and they, you know, of course you start with COVID, you start with, you know, how everyone's health's doing, start about this and that. They ask you a few questions about themselves and then they're very good at like, oh, and, and uh, so I was, um, when I started at working, blah, 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 but they really well, you know, like weaved it into, they made you feel important and then they kind of like weaved in their own story there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a good skill to have, um, just making the, um, the BCG or feel important. It's not necessarily just BCG too. But any company. Yeah, it was, it was really nice because I got an email um, recently from someone and I, I had a decent call with her. Um, we weren't able to interview her, but she said that, Bruce, I just wanted to thank you um, for, because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been able to get a job, um, my summer internship. And I said, well, where are you going? And she said that she's going to um, uh, uh, our competitor, Bain. Mm -hmm. And, but she felt as though our conversation was really instrumental in her networking properly to get her job. And I think that's a great point that talking about, you know, rejection or not getting to either the interview or the subsequent round. So do you value when people reach back out, um, whether it's an email or handwritten letter and saying, you know, I really appreciate your time. It's unfortunate it didn't happen today. But, you know, I, I really took things away from the conversation and maybe I'd love to hear some feedback to improve. Yes. Yes. I mean, that does mean, um, I, I mean, can only imagine you get um, one of the, when, when you talk to people and they, they want to get better, you just want to help them more, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's based upon how you respond to this. And this is like a BCG thing too. Um, we are constantly giving people feedback. We we want because we want you to get better. And if you are, um, you should be that type of person who's just like, yes, I want to hear this feedback because I want to become a better person, right, or a better worker. If you don't, then then that's just a bad, you know, you're a bad BCG citizen, and that's just not a, a good thing. And so um, we do appreciate uh, people who want to get better. And also, you know, what when we have a conversation and say, say, um, you told me that some of the issues that you were having with your resume, and I said, well, this is how you can fix things. And sometimes it's not a matter of it's going to be fixed by the next cycle. It might be the cycle after that, because um, they may be bigger things. And at the at this next cycle, I can at least have this thing where, oh, well, I talked to this person a couple of weeks ago. And they said that, um, you know, they had difficulty with their GPA because of one issue. But you know what? Now I can say a year later, I had a conversation with this person a year ago and they said they had difficulty with their GPA. And now look at, they actually increased it by this. And so they're obviously very interested in BCG. They listened to me, listened to me they listened to the feedback. And now I have a better, I have more support going behind me when I try to get this person an interview. So you value it, when people kind of, apply multiple times and take the feedback that you took your, took the time to give the candidate to use and now say, you know what, Bruce, you said I need to get more internship experience. It's okay. I didn't get this summer internship at BCG, but I interned at this, you know, media company. And now I'm reapplying full time. I took your advice and now I feel like I'm a stronger candidate. 
Yeah. And, and almost like I feel, I feel um, guilty. Mm-hmm. I mean, what's wrong with me? I'm everything I feel guilty about, right? <laughs> <laughs> I feel guilty if I give you advice and then you, um, you follow it and then I don't deliver on it, mm-hmm. you know? And, and it's not, it, it's not a, um, a Bruce says what Bruce says, people get, you know, you automatically get an interview. There's a lot of people who make these, these decisions on who gets interviewed. Um, but I, I would, uh, sometimes you can just like, you raise your hand and say, I want to make an exception here, or this is very important. We should listen to this thing, listen to what's being said right now. And there's a lot of people that I've known for a long time and they, before they could join BCG. And these people have made the effort and you can see it. They have made this effort to get better. And that's, that's, a, big, uh, that's a big selling point for me. Um, and, that's, and that's just because that's the way BCG is. You give you feedback, you act upon the feedback and then you get better. So would you rather have a candidate who's a junior who doesn't feel like they check every box for the junior summer internship, but apply and maybe get rejected, but ask for feedback um, or just apply the next year when you're even stronger? Um, I would, I would rather want them to apply and then I can take a look at their application. I can have a very clear picture because like I said, those, those other things that you, um, at least I will see everything that they would have applied for. They pretty much submitting the same thing they're applying for. They're going to submit the following year. Mm -hmm. So at least I can look at it at that point and then kind of give them advice. I mean, sometimes my advice is like, you're really going to have to have a strong referral for this. Mm-hmm. Sometimes my advice is just, um, you know, you're, you're really going to have to work on your grades. And if you do focus for a year on your grades, you can actually bring it up to something that is, is very, is more desirable. Um, and um, so there's, there's a lot of, um, there's at least advice that I can give. And if those people are really serious about it, sometimes they come back and they're like, Bruce, look what I did. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't fault them for that. I mean, it seems like improvement and not just getting feedback, but actually taking the feedback to heart, changing and becoming a stronger candidate and maybe applying for the following recruitment cycle, something yeah. that, you know, you and, and the company really value. And I think also, like you said, a couple points before having a good story and being able to articulate it both through, you know, networking and kind of selling yourself as well as through the cover letter that you alluded to uh, before. So talking about the cover letter for a second. I know that you have a pretty strong stance on cover letters, if I'm not mistaken. So let me kind of share with us, you know, what is your thought on cover letters? Do they matter? How much weight do they have in the application process? I think the cover letter is an excellent excellent opportunity for a person to screw up. (laughs) And um, I read, I, there's, I think cover letters are one of those things when it gets down to, um, I have to make a decision between a couple of people and they are very, very similar. And let me read their cover letters. Um, and I, I was in, in, I, I've heard over the years occasionally, oh, this is a great cover letter. And I never really ran into that myself, but then um, there was one year when I I had two cover letters and I was trying to, um, or two applications and they were very, very similar. And I was trying to figure out, well, who am I going to bring in? And I read the cover letters and one of them sounded like she was just like this, you know, look how great she was. Look at all these great things that she had done. And she was just so well fit for BCG. Mm -hmm. And the other guy's cover letter, first of all, he explained very briefly his, his any issues with his, um, in his application. So it was nice that he addressed it as opposed to the other person. They were just like, they were just completely ignoring it. So this one, this one um, the guy addressing it, at least he showed that he was aware that I do not meet BCG's high standards. However, um, this is the reason why. So almost giving himself, hey, I'm a red flag probably shouldn't take me before you even started. But I'm aware of it. And so it's just kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm self-aware, right? right? But, and then, and then as I've done all these things in my life, I realized that this was all directing me toward consulting. Mm-hmm. And so he just did a really good job. And so it's just like, okay, well, you're going to get the interview. This other person is just like, they don't, they're not self-aware. They think they're awesome, even though they're, they're not as awesome as they think they are. Do you value self-awareness? Yes. Got it. If someone comes in and they just they're just like, um, um, hey, how are your test scores? My test scores are great. 
and then they show them to me and I'm like, what? what? <laughs> That's understand. so great. Um, as opposed to someone who comes up to me and says like, oh, I'm not, I know they're not very good. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd rather hear that. Than you, want, you, you value transparency and honesty. Make it, you know, a, make it um, prevalent to the recruiter like yourself. But now let's focus on what are my strengths of my application. Exactly. Don't let's not um, let's not dwell on it for the next um, thirty minutes. Mm-hmm. Your weaknesses. Got let's it. talk about it briefly. Let's talk about maybe why it's like that, and then let's let's go into some really cool things. At Got that it. Point. And I think that's such an interesting take because you know I feel like myself or when other people when they're making a cover letter, you want to only talk about the best things on your application, not necessarily weaknesses or holes, and making it obvious that you're not a perfect candidate. But I think it's important, like you said, to touch on what maybe is a weakness, but now let's focus on the, the three fourths rest of the cover letter that your strengths. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Well, and, and, um, and the reason why I'm, I'm kind of scared of cover letters is because we have seen people who would say things like, um, I've, uh, dear BCG, I've always wanted to work for Bain and blah, blah, blah. And we're like, seriously, mm-hmm. Um, it's nice when you get an email like that and then you can respond back to, well, it's really nice, but <laughs> you might <laughs> want to contact them directly. So make sure like, that what? you don't use a template and you actually change the name of the company yes. you're applying to. Yes. That's, that's super um, important. Some people have said this person sounds like they're obsessed. Um, you know, look at, look at all that they're writing. I'm going to work for BCG. I'm never going to go to sleep. I'm just going to work day and night and, uh-huh. and stuff like that. Some people will write in there and they'll say, oh, I want to belong. I, I, the reason why I want to join this company is because I want to be part of the biggest, uh, the largest uh, financial firm in America. Uh-huh. We're like, well, <laughs> we obviously don't know what the job is, right? And so it's just, it's just a place where you can make a lot of mistakes. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I say keep it nice and simple. Got it. So don't be extreme on either side of the spectrum. Just try to have a nice kind of yeah. middle ground cover letter. Awesome. Last part is I would say the cover letters cousin is the resume. And yeah. with resumes, you know, a fact that I've heard and I, I want to see and kind of debunk it and see if it's true with you is do recruiters actually want to look at a resume for up to six seconds? Um. <laughs> I never time myself. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think that, um, you know, school means something to us. I mean, we probably glance at that. We glance at the GPA. Um, we glance at the test scores. We look at your, in, um, your uh, extracurricular activities, your um, internship. I, Here's, here's what I would say about, um, uh, and I don't know if I mentioned this to you before, but maybe this is better, it's good for everyone to, to understand about um, a company like BCG. We look for people who have a lot of energy. And within, um, in the way we determine that is by, and when I say energy, we, I mean like hard work, right? We look for people who are hard workers. You don't, you don't want them just bouncing off the walls in, you know, phone call or interview with you. Yes, we, we yes, exactly. <laughs> so we, we, but we look for people who have shown a consistent amount of energy mm-hmm. throughout a, a, as long as, as a period of time as you can possibly have when you're a very young person, right? So if we go back and we look at test scores, test scores tell us, hey, did this person pay attention in high school? Maybe even junior high school. We look at the school you went to, and some schools are harder to get into than others. Um, School, it's starting to not matter as much, but it still, it just gives you an idea that if I'm going to USC, UCLA, um, I'm I'm talking about our local schools, Pomona College or CMC, Mm -hmm. it's because I probably did a lot of stuff when I was in high school, extracurriculars, things like that. So, and then we look at your GPA when you're in school, because that shows, you know, there's a lot of smart people out there, you know, those smart people who just kind of like show up the last day of the class and you're like, are they actually in this class? You've never seen them for the whole semester. And then yeah, and then they take the test and maybe they get by with a B, B minus, you know, whatever. We don't want that person. We want someone who is just like, this may not be something that I'm interested in and may just be a extra, you know, a required class, but I'm going to try to learn this. Got it. Because at BCG, you often find things that um, here, you're going to work on this. And you're like, 
I never had an interest in this. However, you're still going to have to plow through it, right? Mm -hmm. And so now we look at a combination of all those things. We look at your extracurriculars because that has to do with your GPA. Because if you're, say you're on the, the football team, that's a lot of time. And a tennis team, that's a lot of time. If you're, you know, school president, that's a lot of time. So we look at that too and adjust your GPA, double majors, difficult majors, mm -hmm. easy majors. And then, so we look at all those things and then we try to determine, um, so if we see positives in all these areas, then we can determine that for a third of their life, a third of their life, these people have worked hard mm -hmm. and it's documented and it's right in front of us. And so we are going to, um, they're probably more of a guarantee that they're gonna come into BCG and they're gonna to continue to work hard as opposed to someone who has wavy energy with moments of brilliance, moments of nothingness and kind of going like this, which one are you going to get? Are you going to get this one? Or are you going to get that one? And even if you get this you one, want to see consistency. exactly. And so, and that's what we're looking at. That's why as a recruiter, I do look for those things mm -hmm. because they do mean something to me. If there's any, um, if there's any dents on their resume, then I will say, okay, well, why is this happening? Why did this, why did they have um, poor SAT scores? I remember looking at someone with poor SAT scores, but then they were valedictorian of their high school. How is that possible? I want to know, you know, um, is this a fluke? Because sometimes flukes happen, right? Flukes happen quite often. Um, GPAs, you know, they, they fluctuate. But then when we, that's why we ask for transcripts. When we look at the transcripts, they can say, it was a really tough year. I was having problems with my family and we can see the dip. So we can document this as well. And these are things that I all have to take into the interviewer room and say, when they question these things, I have to say, yes, I understand that. However, this is what happened. So when I look very briefly at a resume, I am not going to read word for word, line for line. Mm -hmm. And that is the interviewer's job. And the interviewer's job is when they talk to you, they want to, and when they want to know what your story is, you're the, they're the ones who are going to read it more clearly. And they're the ones that are going to be getting those details out from you. So Got it. And it looks like so I would say you're probably down to four seconds. So your, your answer of six seconds was wrong. It's four seconds. Four seconds. So you're looking more so for trends, not necessarily just sheer content. Yes. Got it. And I think the one of the, at least for me, one of the coolest parts about the resume is the interest section on the bottom, because it's an yeah. area where you're able to express what you do outside of work. I guess first question is, you know, for you, Bruce, do you, you know, do you advise students and professionals to have an interest section on the resume? Yes, I've, I've noticed that there's, um, it's funny because if you look at the administrative staff in the office, um, sometimes they'll have me look over their resumes um, and I'll notice that they don't put that. They don't have an interest section. And then at the same time, you look at the people who are the MBAs who are applying to BCG, they will have an interest section. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it is something that's, that's important. It's an, it's an opportunity to bond it's an opportunity for maybe to have a lighter moment in the interview. Um, we should not be making decisions um, based upon the fact that you're a Laker fan <laughs> and we're, like, we're a Laker fan. Uh, we should not be doing stuff like that, but um, there is no problem with having a bit of, you know, some, some common ground. So don't go for the professional interest as in I'm interested in, you know, automotive and tech, but more so, what you do on a typical weekend or, or when you're not working, some, some passions or hobbies outside. Yeah, I remember this one guy and this was brought up in, in his interview. Um, they were kind of very fascinated by him because he had um, he was on the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest handshake. <laughs> anyway, but it is, it is nice to have that interest section. It's, Got it. It's nice place. And I, I thought a really great question would be, I know that one of your interests outside of work is pretty unique. Uh, do you mind sharing, you know, what that interest <laughs> is and um, you know, to learn more about it? So, sure. Um, so I have, um, I have an interest in writing children's books. And the way that this come, came about is I've always liked to write. Um, I'm probably not very good at it. That's not, that's not me promoting myself. Don't do this when you're in an interview, right? I really, I'm, I'm, I'm not that good, but I still do it. Um, but, um, but, but, but that's part of it too, is that you're get, I, I hope I'm getting better as I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And um, with, with the way things are nowadays, if I would have decided to do this 20 years ago, I would have needed a publisher. I would have needed all this stuff. But now I, all I need is Amazon 
And um, I wrote a story and I gave it to my friend and I asked her, would you illustrate this for me? Because you're such a good drawer. And she came back to me and she said, Bruce, you don't need me because I had drawn some pictures, which I think was probably her way of saying that, Bruce, I don't want to do this. <laughs> so I decided myself to learn how to draw. And I took my story and I pretty much did a boot camp of just like learning how to draw. And I did come up with three stories and um, um, three stories so far. It's, it's the idea is just to continue writing them. And um, whenever I get an idea, I actually have quite a few ideas. It's just a matter of sitting down and actually drawing the thing. That's probably the longest process because I just don't know how to draw. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I wrote a book called Scary Pants. I wrote a, the sequel to Scary Pants, which is Smarty Pants, of course. And then I wrote another book called Lucky Lucky. Uh, Lucky Lucky came about when I was talking to um, a friend and I said, hey, if you think of a story idea for a book, I'll dedicate it to you. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, why don't you just talk about the injustice of how people don't share and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, take it easy. This is a children's <laughs> book. <laughs> but I can probably come up with something that's a message that's a little nicer than that. Mm -hmm. And it's a little gentler. So, and the nice thing about children's books is, um, you know, a person always start like in Lucky Lucky. Person starts off as um, as um, selfish, and at the end, they're not selfish. And so it's very clear in the very beginning of Scary Pants, the person is messy, and at the end, they're not messy. So it's kind of like it's nice how it's just like it's very easy. Uh, you know what the ending's going to be mm -hmm. before you read it. Got it. And you can find these on Amazon, correct? Sure. Awesome. If you want to, uh, if you want to take a look at Bruce's. Uh, his uh, literature background. I love it. And I think also there are messages. I think behind every children's book, there is a message. Oh, yeah. So what would you say, you know, whether you want to choose one of the three or all three, what is the message and theme behind these books that you want people to take away after reading it? Uh, well, you know, the, the scary pants is, it's more of a fun thing. I, I was, I, I think the message there was, I was just trying to think of what scared me when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then you add in a little story. It's just about a messy kid. And I cannot, I cannot, um, I remember when I, when I told someone about it and they said, well, Bruce, did you learn anything from this book? And I was like, no, because I'm just a mess. You know, I, I <laughs> I'm not going to read this book and change the way I am, but uh, you know, for a kid, it might have a message to it. Um, these, these smarty pants is about a kid who gets like really smart pants. And they, the story behind that one was, is because he, he falls into a vat of computer parts and his pants become really smart. And therefore he's really of smart. And the idea is behind that is there's no shortcut to becoming a smarty pants because apparently, um, apparently at a certain point, the pants get ruined. Um, and then lucky, lucky, it's just has to do with, um, here, I have a copy right here and it has show, to be, show the world. Well, this is lucky, lucky. Awesome. And I love the, Lucky uh, Lucky. the song on there. And the idea behind Lucky Lucky is she finds, she's a very selfish girl and she finds um, two kids who are, who find a magic lamp. And she says, and the lamp says rub three times for three wishes. And she's like, she tells them, Hey, Hey, let's all rub it once and we'll all get a wish. And they're like, okay, fine. So the first kid rubs it and Lucky gets it. And she rubs it twice because she's just, that's just the way she is. Mm -hmm. And so she gets two wishes and one boy doesn't get a wish. But the, the whole idea behind that is um, some of the drawings I, I, I am kind of proud of. I think they're kind of cool. you, So you drew this. This wasn't outsourced to someone else. No, I drew this. And that's what's nice about it is that, you know, I don't have to have anyone. I don't have to go back to somebody and say, mm -hmm. here's my feedback. I'm just like, you know, Bruce, this sucks. But um, uh, this one is about a girl who learns that more happiness, she, she, wants, she wants more things, which she believes will make her more happy but more happiness isn't something that can be wished for. And instead is something that, that gradually comes to people who make others happy. Got it. So it seems like throughout these books, happiness and a positive mindset is kind of the takeaway that you want the readers to have. Would you agree? Oh yeah. Got it. I mean, it's, it's, I, the, the point, I, I think the point of um, the books that I write, it's, it's kind of like you look at the way things that need to be fixed in this world. Mm -hmm. and trying to break it down into a very basic like what can kids understand and hopefully kind of like get that in early um and um and so that's what um and, it, and it's not a matter of um i'm going to teach i want to teach people a b's and c's and ones two one two threes i want to teach them like more like a moral there's moral to the story 
Got it. So kind of tailoring that back into kind of career and recruiting advice. I think, you know, today we're living in this COVID-19 pandemic and unprecedented, you know, unprecedented times. What advice would you give to people who their morale is not very high? They've applied to companies, maybe they froze their hiring, they're getting rejected and they just can't seem to find the right footing. What advice would you have to keep, you know, a positive mindset and keep going and keep pushing? I thought you said you had that was your last question, two questions ago. The Lao's last topic. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So <laughs> thank you for <laughs> correcting me. Um, I, um, and I don't know if this is the right thing to say because I was, I was talking to, I, I, it just kind of came to my mind one day and that um, I, I thought of my cousin, my cousin who's about um, 16 years older than I am. And when he was going to college, he was, um, there were, there was legitimate fear that he was going to get drafted Mm -hmm. and he was going to be drafted. He was going to be showing up in a, a base camp somewhere, going through six weeks of training and then ending up in Vietnam where he was going to be in a jungle somewhere and people were going to be shooting at him. And if you look at the way things were back then, I mean, it was bad, you know? And now our main concern right now is like, oh man, I'm not seeing my parents for Christmas. <laughs> and, and, you know, so it's not that, it's not as bad as it's been and it's not as bad as it could be. Um, we, had, we had some offers that we gave and these people had offers from other firms, you know? So there's a lot of, there were jobs out there and we probably had more cross offers than we were used to this year. So there was, there was a lot of people who, um, a lot of paid places are still hiring. The way that BCG always looks at things is that it's gonna get better. It's either gonna get better or we're all gonna be, well, this isn't BCG looking at things, but this is, this is my thought. Mm-hmm. Either that or we're all gonna be a pile of dust <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> flowing in the wind. So things are going to get better. Um, I think that we have to adjust to what's happening. Um, there's people who have taken the semester off. Some people have taken a year off. Some people have been very clever about it and they've gone to, um, hey, why am I paying Why am I paying all this money to go to this school when I'm not even taking live classes? And why don't I take, th- these classes are transferable from junior college. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to take them at junior college. And I'm going to save myself a lot of money. So, um, you know, it's in, and that, that's just part of being the person, you know, we have to be flexible. Um, we have to stay positive. Um, things will get better. And, and once this vaccine and all this stuff, I was thinking that even, even it's going to be the hiring is going to go off the charts at that point. Travel is going to go off the charts. Everything's just like, everyone's going to want to get so much into back into um, regular life and, and it's going to be business as usual. So, I, I, as a person who's been laid off um, about five times in my life, oh. um, I know you, now you don't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> um, I've been, I've been laid off five times in my life and it always gets better. Mm-hmm. There's always, and I, I see it more as like opportunity. It's like, what's next? And it's kind of like forcing you, you feel as though you're getting a little stale and you're just stuck someplace. And it's just the force forces you to like, okay, now it's time for you to move on. So keep pushing and have a positive mindset. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at you're coming away. You're you're going to have a fantastic degree, a very impressive school, a fantastic degree. Um, you may you may find yourself, but there's a lot of people out there that are like this. You may find yourself, I, I'm not doing what I really want to do, but there's a lot of people out there like that, and so some things you may have to settle for, but um, you know, it's it's always going to get better. I mean, it's like I said, if you look at it uh, the way things were in the 70s, it was just like it was terrible, it was madness, mm-hmm. and it almost makes like what's, you know, if you look at the madness out there now, it's not as bad as that, you know? I mean, it was just like really violent. There was a lot of things that had to be done and, um, you know, we all got through it. So we all got I through mean, it. I, you know, I'm not that old. <laughs> but having a positive mindset is everything. And now I promise, I know I said this last time, but this is actually the final question for today's show. Um, what is the best piece of advice you can give to our audience, to help them get past the final round interview and land the job offer. Um, the so now we're talking about we're in the we're in the interview. Anything overall, I would just say that, like you can choose one specific thing or 
you know, in the interview recruitment process, the biggest thing, if you had to give one piece of advice to someone trying to get past that final round, what would you say? I would say um, probably listening. See you later. <laughs> no, but I think listening is is important. Um, whenever, whenever, quite often we have um, as as uh, BCG isn't looking for people who are so smart that they know everything. We're looking for people who are um, who are capable. Of, um, of learning things quickly, of, of, um, but we don't expect them to know everything. And so when you, when you come in and you don't know a topic, you just ask BCG, could you please explain this to me? And they will, they're more than happy to. Um, they don't want you to ask that same question over and over again, but they're willing to answer it once, maybe give some clarifying questions. But and they want you to listen to it and they want you to react based upon what you've heard, right? That is, that is important there. It's important when you're talking to me, if I'm, if I'm giving you advice, if, you're, if you have a conversation with me and I'm giving you advice on, this is what you have to do to have your best shot at BCG. If you're gonna have any shot at BCG, this is your best shot and listen to me and react to that, then that's great. You know, and, and the same thing is when, so it, a lot of it just, just has to do with not knowing, understanding that you don't know everything. And almost at this, this point in your life, you don't know anything, but that's fine because we are going to teach you things. And all we ask in return is for you to retain that information Got it. and act upon that information. So listen and act upon it. I love that. And that's great advice. Bruce, I know you've been here for a while. Uh, thank you so much for being here. 